So I'd like to introduce my panel. We're going to we are going to uh, be discussing today what some of those obstacles to the courthouse are, so that you guys can understand some of the, ele the legislative initiatives that you might see at the state house uh, this session that will either protect our access, uh, people's access to the courts, or undermine them further. Jeffrey Schneider is with the Indiana Farm Bureau. He joined the Farm Bureau in 2005 as a staff attorney. He works on environmental and energy issues with a focus on regulatory affairs. And he's a registered lobbyist for the Farm Bureau in both the executive and legislative branches. Warren Matthews, which is over here to my left, who is over here to my left, he was born in uh, Huntingtonburg, Indiana. Okay. He was admitted to the Indiana Bar in 2004 after receiving his uh, uh, bachelor's degree in political science from Purdue, and he has uh, his legal degree from Indiana University School of Law in Indianapolis. He uh, currently works for uh, ITLA as a registered lobbyist working on legislative issues um, for preserving citizen access to the courts and equal access to the courts for people in the state of Indiana. Representative Judd McMillan, who is on uh, to my left over here, uh, Republican, uh, House Representative, District uh, 68, he came into the legislature in 2010. Uh, his district includes the counties of Dearborn, Franklin, Ohio, Ripley, and Switzerland. He has a BS in economics from the University of Cincinnati and a law degree from the University of Mississippi. I invited Representative McMillan to be on the panel today because he broke with his party last year uh, to oppose uh, HB 1091, which we'll be talking about, um, a bill that was meant to have somewhat of a chilling effect on people who were trying to have access to the courts to address problems related to industrial agriculture. And then finally, over here to the right, Tom Young is a resident of Jay County. He uh, was born and raised in Portland, moved away, lived in California for 35 years, and, and returned. Upon his return, I, I'd like to read for you something that he wrote to me that he wrote about his county, which has the highest number of capos in them. The dramatic change in agricultural practices and unbridled growth of the confined feeding industry, which has come about in my absence, was an eye-opener for me. The negative impact on our watersheds and our quality of life has brought me to the belief that we need to do a better job of finding ways to plan a sustainable course for Jay County and the state of Indiana as well. So now we're going to, uh, in my very delayed fashion, Fallon, open up the discussion to the panel. And I would like to start with Warren. Uh, if you could talk to us a little bit about the legal theory that people would be um, trying to address issues such as odors, dust, particle pollution from CAFOs, what would be the legal theory that would bring them to the courthouse doors to, to address their issues? Um, 
So I think uh, when we see changes to the law, my clients, the folks I represent, like to see that the nuisance law remains and it remains as broad as possible so that we can uh, take care of any unforeseen things that come down the road because we don't know um, how environmental issues will evolve over time. Uh, we don't know some of the you know, issues that come with complex society like um, confined feeding or industrial size uh, food, food programs or uh, recently you're hearing a lot about uh, fracking uh, and coal, uh, shale gas and how folks are dealing with that and what chemicals are used. And from my standpoint, I believe that the checks and balances that were provided by our forefathers, um, we fought the war on English rule a long time ago when we took on the English and became our own country. So it's my position that the United States should remain a country that allows free and open access to courts without hindrance or chilling effect items like the nuisance uh, law. Uh, so I think that might get to your question about the right avenue. And nuisance, for the most part, is, is where we would go. There's some other ancillary areas that can be used to enforce um, a person's right, but you have to get it through, through a third party, like a government. Someone violates his own, his own law or a local regulation or a state regulation. Could you just briefly also uh, tell us what would be the relief that a person would get uh, if they were to prevail in a nuisance suit? Well, a lot of times it's a cease and desist order uh, or uh, a court. A lot of times uh, lawyers uh, are forced to come up with a compromise or forced to mediate. And so sometimes there's some creative ways um, that uh, can be addressed once you've got some leverage in the court system and there's some fear that somebody might have to quit farming. Um, lawyers sometimes come to the table and come up with unique ways. And, they can have some sub pre suit or uh, pre trial settlement discussions that might include times of day where, where uh, uh, the ammonia issues or the waste are, are, are taken away. There could be certain uh, uh, abatement procedures that are used and things like that. Money damages and, and injunction. Okay. But money damages aren't always, they're hard to quantify because you're also often legislating somebody's you know, smell and, and uh, whether it increases their property value, and you're going to have some arguments over what their appraiser says versus our appraiser. So a lot of times, when you get there, push comes to shove, it's usually cease and desist and unjust conduct. Okay, so basically we'd be able to tell the, the neighboring industrial facility that was causing the harm to stop causing the harm. Right. That's what we mean by that. Okay, great. Um, Tom, I'd like to talk to you for a minute. You're, you're from Jay County. Um, which is the county with the most uh, capos in it. I think 88 is the number. And I was really moved by your letter to me. And I, I think it would be nice if you could share with the audience what your concerns, what it is that you've seen since you've moved home from California. Uh, thank you, Kim. First of all, I'll explain that this happened. Uh, I was trying to hug a tree. And, 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 uh, <laughs> So, not painful. <laughs> um, well, I, I think that um, I grew up on a dairy farm, third generation uh, dairy farm in, in Jay County. So I had a background of, of uh, small farming and um, um, one of the reasons uh, for coming back to this part of the country was uh, that connection to the, to the land. And um, I discovered that after a short time in uh, in Jay County, uh, and I knew that this uh, the, the CAFO business was growing there, but um, I had no idea how um, I guess as I used in my uh, piece there uh, how unbridled it, it is uh, and has been. Um, there is a um, uh, an ordinance uh, for uh, controlling uh, the CAFO industry or the locations uh, to some extent. Uh, setbacks are required and uh, um, certain, uh, you know, uh, requirements. setbacks apply to existing facilities and the ones that are there. You just got this zoning ordinance passed in March, right? Uh, 
No, there's been a zoning ordinance there for some time. It's it required the setbacks? There were requirements, okay. yes, but the requirements have been adjusted along the way as we've seen um, the need. Um, and I was uh, involved in, in some of those changes uh, to, uh, to increase setbacks from, um, from uh, floodplain and uh, and in the, the case of the, the one you're speaking of, that had to do with recreational uh, areas uh, and an attempt to build a, a CAFO uh, very near uh, Bear Creek Farms, which is a uh, uh, restaurant and recreational area. And uh, so those, those uh, kinds of uh, controls have been in place. Unfortunately, uh, Having a very pro ag uh, commission, commissioners, and BZA board of zoning appeals, uh, it's been, I, I feel, too easy to uh, uh, allow variances uh, to um, change the, essentially change those, those setback rules and to impact the neighbors. Um, and uh, in the case of the last. Uh, the, the incident that brought about this last change, uh, the party involved who wanted to build there was asking for a, a variance uh, and um, ultimately was uh, denied that and then, uh, then the setbacks were changed which uh, precluded them building there. But um, in the process, uh, the word that came down from party that wanted the bill was that to his neighbors who were concerned and upset that this was happening so close to them was that if they didn't like it they could move to town and uh, I find that kind of attitude to be uh, reprehensible and I, I think that that this is the, the nature of my concern is that we're, we are so concerned about the right to farm, the right to uh, use your land in a certain way that we're not, that we're overlooking the greater picture of uh, what others' rights are and, uh, and considering them as well. Let, let's, let's switch to Justin. Um, can you tell us what right to farm is, just so the audience understands what the right to farm is? The, the right to farm law is simply a statute that uh, it, it limits the ability of a person to recover for alleged injuries um, from agricultural activities that are taking place nearby. And uh, it's a policy decision of the, of the state that uh, wanted to protect the agricultural resources and the ability to use the uh, ever-shrinking area of farm that we have in the state. And so there, there are some limits that are put on nuisance. And there are exceptions to, to that. If a farm is operated negligently, the right to farm does not apply, and someone can still recover. But in, in, you know, in a nutshell, if a farmer is doing everything appropriately, um, even if there are some impacts upon you, there you may not be able to recover under this theory. Um, I have the right to farm act on the on the screen in case you guys want to look at it, and I'd like you to. Uh, Explain. There's a couple of provisions in there that I, I know from my work have presented some particular obstacles for people who are trying to bring these suits to protect their properties. Um, one of them is the idea that you get a, a year period of time in order to bring your nuisance suit, um, but you would be precluded if the operation is an agricultural operation and there has been no significant change. And so, although that sounds reasonable, could you touch upon what that really means? What is a significant change? What is it and what isn't it? Well, that's a good question, Kim. It's one of those areas that when you look at the case law, you really can't answer it. Um, you know, I, I think the issue, it, it, it probably comes down to if in that, you know, the first year there's a farm there and, you know, there are clearly lots of problems, then, then there's no protection. Um, after you've got a farm in existence for a year, um, then then they they can make changes. They can they can get bigger. They can add livestock. They can switch the type of livestock that's there, and that's still protected. So, 
there's case law that says this, and correct me if I'm, if I'm wrong, but if there's a facility that for 20 years grew corn crops, and then they switch to being a capo, which so often happens, they've already been in, in existence for 20 years, the year's gone. And so that significant change to being a livestock facility is not a significant, a significant change, right? That, that is correct, yes. That's, that's what's in the statute. So this particular change, or provision in right to farm has really operated to preclude um, citizens from access to the courts in these cases before. Um, let's switch to Judd. I'm sorry, Representative McMillan. I, we've had so many wonderful phone conversations that uh, getting a little too friendly. <laughs> On the phone, on, with conversations, okay. So we saw last year HB 1091. Can you tell the audience what that was? Sure, I'll do my best to begin. As um, we've been discussing, the Right to Farm Act is a, is a provision that substantially limits folks' ability to enter the courtroom and to seek redress for grievances that they have when there's a farming operation next to them. Uh, it, it already does a pretty good job of substantially limiting what those uh, avenues they can pursue are. 1091, when it was first introduced, contained a whole bunch of language. It is not in, it was not in the past version of the bill, but uh, I guess to use a, a term that we use in the State House and is somewhat appropriate because we're talking about capos, uh, they say that making legislation is a lot like making sausage. You know? There's a lot of stuff that goes into it. You hope that the end product that comes out is okay, but you really don't want to see what happens as it's being made. Uh, and that went on with 1091. There's a whole bunch of language in there that was just really, really bad language in my opinion for a lot of reasons. But then that language was largely removed. And what we ended up with was language that was an effort to further restrict people's right to seek redress through the courtroom, uh, through the means that Warren was previously discussing. And it was an effort to get more towards, as Warren touched on, the English rule versus the American rule, which is a loser pays system. Uh, right to farm aside, 1091 aside, we can have a discussion about whether or not a loser pays system is a better system than our current system if you want. But I think it's inappropriate to have a discussion about whether or not we should have loser pays only in one specific area. And that's what this did, is it really limited it down to say, we're going to have loser pays in this one specific area. If we're going to have a discussion about loser pays legislation, I, I firmly believe that it should be a much broader discussion to talk about whether or not we should go down that road and we'll have that debate, but we shouldn't limit it here. In addition, what 1091 did, even though it was an effort to, to create this loser pays legislation in, that, in this one area, it completely failed to do that. Uh, in, in my opinion, as an attorney who operates in these areas sometimes, 1091 is very ineffectual. It says that um, for, for somebody to take advantage of loser pays, <coughs> that the court has to find that the, either the defense or the case itself was frivolous and then they're required to uh, impose sanctions. Well, the law already provides for courts to determine if something is frivolous to make that, to, to make the determinations that provide sanctions. In practice, the fact of the matter is, courts just don't do that um, unless it is just so egregious that it doesn't even pass the smell test or the straight face test. The courts don't go about finding that things are frivolous. Um, so, uh, not only do I disagree with what its content was, it didn't even get to the content, in my opinion, that it, that it wanted to achieve. And as a legislator, I, I view it as my job to make sure that we protect the integrity of our, of our legal system and all of the laws. So I just couldn't, in good faith, vote for a bill that I disagree with its premise, and it didn't even get to the premise. It just seemed to be like so much of the legislation that all of us probably sit on our couches and complain about when we say, I can't believe those guys are up there doing this type of stuff when there are things that are much more important they should be addressing. So, uh, I have a bunch of audience questions here, so I'm going to ask one more question myself. Absolutely. I guess I will take a little different tact on what I think the premise was. Um, I lobbied for this piece of legislation. Um, we were approached by, by some individuals and legislators who were interested in doing something in SRK. And I can, I can tell you that we never went into that thinking that it was going to be a loser pays provision. It was strictly about what uh, I think a lot of people saw as a trend to use nuisance lawsuits to stop the construction of large livestock operations, regardless of how they were operated or how the operator was going to manage that operation. 
And so from that standpoint, the concern was, it was about people actually filing frivolous lawsuits. Now the original version, um, it had more than frivolous, but it, it mirrored. Can I, can I ask you, what, what, how many frivolous lawsuits were there in Indiana? What, where did you get that? Because I, I never found any. We looked and I found 10 lawsuits in the last decade, not one of them that been found to be frivolous. So what, what numbers and where um, you, were you looking at? You, you will look long and hard at case law in the state of Indiana to find anything that's a frivolous lawsuit. Um, I clerked at the Indiana Court of Appeals for four years, and there were cases that come through that generally there was, you could find a judge who believed that it was clearly frivolous. I mean, it was, there was enough there that you knew it was meant to harass somebody or it was about something else. And, but you, there's just a reluctance to, to find that the case is frivolous. The concern now is, oh, not all, but several of the recent lawsuits have been filed that haven't been settled yet. And when you read those cases, um, they make allegations that aren't true. Uh, they suggest farming practices that are going on at these farms that aren't actually occurring at those farms. And um, just looking at that trend and, and what was going on with those cases, there was concern that they weren't necessarily meant to address an existing injury. What about Representative McMillan's point that existing law already uh, addressed and gave remedy to a victim of someone who, who was the subject of a frivolous policy? And, and specifically, I'll draw your attention to this trial rule, Indiana Code 3452, 1-1-P. That and our professional ethics rules as attorneys to file frivolous lawsuits. Why were those not adequate protection? The, the, the difference is in may and shall. That a court may award the fees or the court shall award the fees and find it frivolous. So the court can still find a case that's frivolous and say we're not going to award the fees. And, and so I think in that regard, it, it was not meant to have a chilling effect on legitimate lawsuits, but it was meant to, to have a chilling effect on frivolous lawsuits, and that's, that's the issue that was trying to be addressed by this legislation. Sure. The distinction, I understand very well, between the, the language of May and shall, but um, it is, in reality, it's a distinction without a difference, and practically speaking, a lot of the legislative, by the language in the legislation is clearly different. It still requires a judge to make that finding. So when we talk about this in practice, uh, the judge has the opportunity, if the language says shall, the judge is still up to the judge to whether or not the finds to be privileged. So if he knows he's going to be bound by the language of the statute by the terminology of shall, he just won't make a determination that it's frivolous. Uh, if the language was made, the judge can say, all right, I found it's frivolous, but I still don't want to issue the sanctions. So, there is, uh, as Justin pointed out, a very, uh, very clear distinction in the language. But when you talk about how it will be implemented in practice, there's not a clear distinction to be made at all. Great. All right, we're going to open this up to the audience. And there's a question here that actually was going to be my next question. So it, it's going to bring us to this upcoming legislative session. I should give you a little bit of background. There was a recent Indiana Court of Appeals case that uh, Actually, it was one that I represented Eric and Lisa Stickthorn, who are in the audience today. And um, the Court of Appeals held in a footnote that right to farm, the, the law that we talked about earlier that provides immunity to agricultural operations largely from nuisance suits, um, that that law does not apply to nuisance lawsuits brought between two farmers. And the Indiana Court of Appeals looked at the preamble to the Right to Farm Act, which, when it was enacted, was enacted to permit uh, to prohibit urban sprawl, urban encroachment from the cities into agricultural areas. You know, people move from the cities, they don't like the smells, and then they bring a nuisance lawsuit. So it was really intended to prevent that. And the court, looking at that purpose, said, well, we're not going to decide which agricultural property is more important here. If if the nuisance lawsuit is between two farmers and right to farm act doesn't apply. Um, the question here is from the audience, preamble to Indiana right to farm, how does the Farm Bureau intend to care for the environment, rural residents, and small non polluting farmers while providing consumers with the cheap abundant food to which they have become accustomed as a product of factory farming? I guess we'll, 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 we'll agree to disagree about the term factory farming. But um, to us, it's all agriculture. It's all farming. Um, and we represent individuals of all sizes. We've got small, itch, organic, uh, direct-to-consumer farmers. And we represent large capital operators and everybody in between. And I work with all of them. I do programs with all of them trying to help them understand how to, how to better
better operate their business, uh, how to make more money, and how to comply with regulations. And, and so we do have a lot of experience um, trying to do that. I, I think one of the things that where our commitment has been, where the commitment of our members, is when you look at the recent changes in environmental regulations in Indiana, uh, the state campus office has adopted the rules requiring certification of applicators, uh, fertilizer materials. So anyone who's applying from a, from a combined feeding operation or an out-of-state facility, there was a problem with facilities um, in Ohio sending poultry litter to Indiana and staging it in fields for several months at a time. We supported that. Our members supported that. And so those folks have been certified by the state to apply to the State Chemist Office adopted the fertilizer use rule. We supported that. We were there at the table. That applies to all farmers, regardless of size. And it is some basic regulations and things farmers must do. Thank you, Justin. Going back to the, the sort of point of the preamble to the right to farm and the idea that both farmers should be able to protect their land, so they both own agricultural land. And anybody on the panel, please feel free to jump in. Um, I, you and I had a conversation some time ago where you indicated that Farm Bureau might be uh, looking to rewrite that preamble to just say a nuisance is a nuisance and it doesn't matter who's bringing it. If it's against an ag operation, it doesn't matter. That seems to be a direct attempt to undermine that decision in the Stickdorn case. Um, and so maybe you could speak to that, if that's what that's about. Um, and I would, of course, welcome other panelists to chime into this discussion. Yeah, yeah I, I think the concern, and, and since you and I talked, I think, yeah, it, it is the way the Court of Appeals said in the footnote that probably bothers me more than the TDM case. Um, when you read that preamble and what it was meant to address, I think it was meant to address, a lot of other people think it was meant to address uh, claims for impact to non-agricultural uses of property. And the concern was, you know, someone who's, who's unfamiliar with agriculture doesn't like the smell, so they bring a lawsuit. You know, generally everybody used to raise livestock that lived in the country, and that's not the case anymore. So, so the concern wasn't so much that a farmer, an existing farmer was going to sue and they were for an impact because they could smell the livestock operation. I grew up on a farm. We smelled two neighboring livestock farms. That, I was home two weeks ago. We smelled the neighboring livestock farm. Neither one of those are combined feeding operations. They're both small dairies. It's just, that's the fact of life. And so, I think that the difficulty with the way the court worded that footnote and then what they said to TDM is that they are drawing a distinction based upon whether or not somebody's a farmer versus based upon if it's the harm to an agricultural use or non-agricultural use of the property. Well, sure, but let, let's t take a step back for a minute to the Stickdorn case itself. Eric and Lisa Stickdorn raised grass-fed cattle for 20 years, I'm sorry, uh, 10 years before the CAFO moved in. And I'm intimately familiar with that case. The activities of the neighboring CAFO plummeted their own property value and ability to sell it contaminated the streams on their property such that their own cattle had to be kept from it. They couldn't drink it because of the um, contamination in the waterways. They were driven from their home. They live in an apartment to this day. So why is it their property is less important to the farm bureau as farmers uh, than that of the neighboring uh, CAFO or facility that caused the harm? And, and I actually, I'm going to, just to let that sort of settle in the audience, I'd like to shift to Tom for a minute. Um, Justin was talking earlier about regulations that exist <coughs> that protect and address some of the, the issues that your, your community is facing. What has been your experience um, and what have you heard in your community when there are attempts to um, seek help from IDEM, for example, or um, from other local officials? What has been the experience? <coughs> Well, I think the, uh, the IDEM uh, concerns uh, have to do with the fact that uh, we have, we know we have serious um, water issues with uh, the Salamone and Wabash River watersheds, which essentially um, are, uh, their headwaters are in, in Jay County. And so, um, Whenever the discussion uh, about those uh, that contamination comes up, to me it's a it's kind of a red herring that 
that's thrown out that, uh, well, it's, it's the combined sewer uh, overflows and the uh, um, failed septic systems and other um, and, and, uh, runoff. And yet, um, we have had very stable populations, and in fact, declining populations of humans in the counties that, that um, border those watersheds. But the growth in animal agriculture is, is, has grown exponentially. So um, it doesn't seem to make sense to me that we have pollution that's related to human activity. But we are addressing those issues. Each, uh, many of those communities are having to um, you know, separate their sewers and, and make changes. And I agree that ultimately we need to quantify the sources, but we can't uh, we can't uh, negate the fact that there's also a uh, we need to address from the from the agriculture side of it. So. Final question for this this side of the table, uh, Representative McMillan. Um, we were talking a minute ago about a potential effort um, to rewrite the preamble to right to farm. Could you speak to the fact? Um, about what we can expect as by way of support or opposition for such a bill in the legislature this session. Well, I hesitate to speak on behalf of my colleagues and folks in the Senate, but I guess what I can tell you is that uh, I understand that there may be an effort to, to move in that direction, and it's just going to be a question of seeing what type of sausage the, the machine spits out when we talk about who does support and who doesn't. I, I think that you are going to see in the legislature uh, an, an effort um, to try and protect agriculture. Uh, and I, I come from a very rural area where there is a lot of farming. I'm very supportive of agriculture. Uh, but I, I do think that you will continue to see people like myself and other folks stand up, uh, even if we agree with the principles, uh, where a piece of legislation is trying to get to, to make sure that we get the right legislation to get that job done. I think that's, uh, while, while public policy is obviously very important, something seriously. Uh, you can't just focus on the, the big idea of the public policy. We have to focus on what the nuts and bolts is and whether we're really achieving the means that we want to achieve. Great, thank you. Uh, Warren, could you provide, you've been working in the legislature uh, for quite a while, can you provide three things that citizens can do to have their voices heard on this particular issue um, or other issues with respect to uh, preserving equal access to the courts? Thank the panel and especially a round of applause for Justin Schneider for coming into the, the line.